slightly less shiny. And I think everybody should mute until you are called on just for fine. And then via email that I'm gonna I'm gonna throw into the chat, Michelle. Sounds good. Let's get started in another minute. Just see if some more people come in. Welcome. Um, I'm going to get this uh, panel started this morning, this afternoon. Uh, welcome to Audiobook Publishing 101 for Authors, hosted by Randolph College MFA program as part of the all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book, a program of the Virginia Humanities. I'm Chris Gomer, Assistant Director of the Randolph College MFA. Thanks for joining us. This program is one in a series of six devoted to Virginia writing and publishing presented by writing centers and organizations across Virginia. In addition to Randolph College MFA, other hosts are 1455 Literary Arts, James River Writers, The Muse, Watershed Lit, and Writer House. The full series of events are available at vabook.org, where you can also explore the full festival schedule and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to these to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. Also, this event has been closed captioned, which you can turn on and customize at any time during the event by using the closed caption tab at the bottom of your window. Now I'm pleased to introduce the moderator for today's event, Michelle Cobb, uh, who is a publisher of both Audiophile Magazine and MMB Media. Thanks for joining us today, Michelle. It's all yours. Thanks, Chris. Well, I'm very excited to be here with some exciting and excellent talent. We have four narrator producers, and one of whom is actually an author as well, who will talk to you about a variety of different topics. We will be taking questions throughout. So if you look, there is a Q&A box. We do ask that you put your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, so we can follow along um, most efficiently. So I thought I would kick us off today before introducing each of our narrator producers by talking about what's happening in audiobooks. Well, it's all good news. We have been for quite some time now, kind of the golden child of publishing. We have seen eight years in double digit growth in both dollar and unit sales. When I started in the industry 20 years ago, it was definitely a niche product. Today, we are an important part of making sure that you are exploiting your title, your intellectual property, as it were, across all different formats so that people can read it 
the way they want at the moment that they want. There are a number of people who are book readers who don't actually read with their eyes, but only read with their ears. So you have the opportunity to attract all of those readers with your ears, as well as all of your regular readers. We also see that people go back and forth between the formats and with so much multitasking and even so much time at home when we're looking for entertaining entertainment, we're definitely looking for things to do that we don't have to have our eyes on at that same moment. So a lot of listening, even before the pandemic left us all at home, was actually done in the house, mostly using devices that you all have, such as a smartphone. All right, I'm going to kick us off by having Karen White, who is also an author, uh, talk about knowing your audiobook rights. And remember, if you have a question, please put it into the Q&A box. Hi, thanks, Michelle. Um, so happy to be here. Um, I am an author, uh, but my name um, in the author realm is Karen Gray, just to be clear. Um, so. I find that more and more authors are actually more savvy about uh, knowing who, uh, where, who owns and what is the status of their audiobook rights, but it really is the place to start. So if you are not independently published, um, in which case you do generally have the control of your rights, the first thing you want to find out if you are already not already in audiobooks is who has the rights and what's happening with them. Um, you or your agent can uh, prod gently or, or perhaps not so gently um, your print publisher to exercise or sell those rights to a dedicated audiobook producer or publisher, or you can have them reverted back to you. So then you can take the journey to get them into audio. Um, you can sell those sub rights directly to, again, a dedicated audiobook publisher. Some examples are Brilliance, Tantor, Blackstone, Recorded Books. Or, um, and in that scenario, whether um, you sell them directly or your print publisher does, this is for you the least amount of risk. You don't have to invest further in creating an audiobook, but it's also the lowest percentage of royalty that you're going to get. Um, it can be very small. So um, if you want to take on that risk and also perhaps have 100% of the royalties, um, uh, coming from the distributors, then um, you want to go down the self-publishing route. And there's three basic options there. One, you can hire a producer who will take care of everything for you, including casting and often, um, and we'll get into this more in the casting section, but what's helpful there is that they have relationships with narrators and may able to um, get you a sort of name narrator, or um, if you're looking for a very specific ethnicity or accent, it can be helpful to go uh, through a producer. Another um, option, the one that probably most uh, authors already know about, is to work through a DIY platform. The biggest ones are Findaway and ACX. Um, the main um, Findaway, the nicer thing about working through them to find your uh, narrator is that they give you a narrowed down selection of, of narrators to choose from, but they do take a percentage in order to do that. ACX, which is a subdivision of Audible, um, is the cheaper way to do it and can be extremely um, inexpensive, but you often will get either multitudes of auditions that you'll have to sift through or none at all, depending on how you plan to pay for or not pay for your audiobook. And the final um, way is to work directly with a narrator. This takes a little bit more organizational time on your part as well as more research, but it's the one that I personally recommend. Um, it's fun <laughs> and um, you uh, have to do a little bit of work, but you can really find the narrator that you feel the best about this way. Um, so that's it. I do have um, all this in a couple of different formats um, in the resources tab on my website if you if you want more information. And that's KarenWhiteAudiobooks.com. Thanks, Karen. There was a question that was emailed in asking about someone being published by a hybrid publisher. 
and you know they have the opportunity to publish their audiobook as well as the ebook. Um, and we're wondering if there's a standard fee. Now we don't get too much into fees due to antitrust laws, but anything that's published or any advice um, that you can provide from anyone on the panel would be welcome. And they also are wondering if audiobook rights would be instrumental to secure a film de deal in the future. Can anyone speak to either of those? What? I think Andy might be, I mean, the only thing I, I have no idea about the film rights. Um, and uh, the only example I can think of is The Martian, <laughs> which um, was produced uh, by Podium as an audiobook before it was even in print. And it was such a huge success that then Random House bought those rights. But I think the film rights were sold even before that. Um, so if you have a huge success, maybe, um, but I don't know about the hybrid situation. Andy, anything to add on to the hybrid? Okay, so what I will say is uh, yes, you know, I encourage you to take a look at doing that. The, the fees are not necessarily standard. It's by the, the um, group that you are working with and you should ask them directly for the fees. Each group is, is different based on their own particular model. I think what I would suggest is maybe um, looking at different audiobook production companies and uh, researching, you know, reach out to a few and ask what their fees are. And then you can compare that to, uh, to what this hybrid publisher is offering. You can also go to the ACX and Findaway websites, as well as the sagaftra.com websites to find out um, what base rates are. And I put all of those things uh, into the chat, actually. So we are on target. All right, we're going to turn things over to Andy to talk about the various distribution options. Hi. Um, as a producer, I consider myself neutral when it comes to distribution. So I try to stay up on what the options are, but I don't tip the scales in terms of one or the other, because there are a number of reasons why the authors that I produce for through Lyric Audiobooks would choose um, Audible exclusive versus going wide. And sometimes they start with ACX exclusive and then go wide after a period of time. So um, first talking about going uh, Audible ACX exclusive, if you use ACX, which I've heard described as match.com for authors and narrators, it's owned by Audible, which is in turn is, as you know, owned by Amazon. And if you want the highest possible royalty, which it would be 40%, then you choose exclusive distribution, which means that it will appear on Audible, Amazon, and usually iTunes, most of the time iTunes. Um, and if you are doing any kind of a royalty share with the producer or narrator of your book, then that means that you would split that 40%, so 20% to each of you, as opposed to buying out the narrator and keeping all 40% um, of the royalties. Uh, and iTunes for audiobooks, now Apple Books. Thanks for reminding me, Michelle. So if after 90 days, um, after three months, you are now free to go wide. And going wide can happen through a number of dif different distribution outlets, such as uh, Find A Way, which was already mentioned, um, Audiobooks Unleashed, Spoken Realms, Big Happy Family, Authors Republic, Blackstone. Um, several of these I have worked with and I have had good experiences um, across the board it tends to be a fairly straightforward process. So what you're going to want to know um, is, you know, where will my audiobook be available? Um, what can you tell me about the, the royalty split on these various outlets? I want to talk about two um, distribution options in particular that I think are worth uh, lifting up out of this discussion. One is Libro.fm, which you will find on a lot of wide options. It's an app like Audible, which I use, um, and Libro.fm started as a way to incentivize uh, independent bookstores to recommend audiobooks, uh, digital audiobooks, which obviously they're not on the shelves. And so why would a, an independent bookseller necessarily be talking about digital downloads of audiobooks? So Libro.fm um, encourages bookshop owners to recommend audiobooks because a portion of that sale benefits um, 
that bookstore or any bookstore that you designate. So I designated Harriet's Bookshop in Philadelphia. Um, but you can choose any bookstore that you have a, an attachment to or a different one every month or whatever you want to do. Um, and the other thing I wanna talk about is libraries and why you would want to be in libraries. Um, there was just an article in the Washington Post this morning about uh, library patrons wanting access to the same audiobooks um, that are being talked about you know, in reviews on the web. They wanna be able to check those out of their library. And there's some evidence that your sales will increase um, if you're available in libraries, why? Because either somebody checks out your audiobook, they loved it so much they wanna re-listen right away. Re-listening is a big thing with audio fans, but now they're at the end of the line and they wanna to listen to it like right now. So they go buy it or they get your audiobook from the library and they love it and they want to find more of the things that you've written that are in audio, but the library only has you know, a small amount of your work in its catalog. So they go to a retail outlet and they buy more of your work. Um, so it's a great way for people to discover your work. And it's also a great way for you to invigorate awareness of a title that maybe has been out for a while. Um, so thanks for the uh, information about the library stuff in the chat, Michelle. And um, I, think, I think I've covered distribution fairly, um, fairly exhaustively. Um, yeah. One question for you. If you want to sell direct from your website, um, which would you choose, exclusive or non-exclusive? If I wanted to sell direct from my website? Yep. I can answer that. You thanks, must. Karen. You must choose non-exclusive uh, to sell directly, which Find a way has an option called Authors Direct, but also independent authors may know about Book Funnel, Book Funnel, which has a uh, way to sell direct in beta right now that I'm participating in, and it is awesome. I can also recommend programs like Gumroad, which make it easy to sell one or two titles at a very low cost and add to your website. And if your website's built in something like WordPress, there are plenty of different audio plugins that you can try there. Yeah, and I will mention that we have had an author choose to have a novella on her website to listen directly from her website. And that was intentionally designed not to require people to go to any app, download anything, give any credit card or anything to remove all friction from the trying audiobooks experience so that the listener could just see, do I like, you know, maybe they think they don't like audiobooks, but they haven't tried it in a while since they were a kid. Um, and it gives them a chance to try the audiobook format without that barrier of like, oh man, I gotta put my credit card, what's going on, so. Absolutely. And I did put a link to the Panorama, Panorama Project, which is a recent survey that was done um, with the, the Panorama Project group to talk about how libraries impact buying and impact uh, consumers' interactions with books. We know from a long standing point of the industry that libraries were a great place for listening. And certainly in the pandemic, we've seen some amazing gains in digital library listening, specifically in the children's realm as well. All right, thank you very much, Andy. And remember, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Next up, we're gonna turn things over to Ronnie Butler to talk about casting, because once you've written the book, if you wanna have an audio book, the next thing you have to do is find the right voice. Good morning, everyone. Hi, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, Karen mentioned um, uh, a couple of things. She mentioned ACX and she mentioned um, Find a Way. And I, our first task, of course, is we've got we've got actually two tasks. Like, where are you going to find your narrators, and then how are you going to select the narrator once you have a list of um, a list of options? Um, there's certainly uh, many of you are probably familiar with ACX, which is an uh, I think Andy said match.com, um, where you can post a script of your, a section of your, of your book and have narrators um, submit samples. Um, you can often become quickly overwhelmed. Uh, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of narrators on. And as Karen said, you might not get any results. 
Um, so then where do you go? Uh, services like Findaway, of course, can do that uh, for you. Or if you're hiring a producer to produce your book, then of course they will do the casting for you. But obviously they're, go they're also going to take a cut. Um, you're a shortcut and perhaps your best bet might be to just simply research your comps and also bots and see who is narrating books in your genre or subgenre out there and reach out to those people uh, specifically. All, all the narrators are on social media. They're all easily reachable. You can find them on Facebook. You can find them on Twitter. They're all there and they all want to be found. So it's, it's, that's not that difficult a job. And um, you know, uh, you know where your book lies and you know who your competition is or, or uh, what your market is, you can find the people that are already, already narrating in that genre and seek them out. Um, once you have your list, wherever you get your list from, um, then you're going to, of course, wonder how do you select the right person. If you've never really listened to audiobooks before, and I know a lot of authors haven't, um, I recommend that you get up to speed by doing some listening. Um, and I would recommend going to Audiophile Magazine's website, um, research earphone award winners and audio award winners from past years within your genre, and start listening to what are considered good narrators and good books. Um, you want to listen for uh, narrators that make you forget that you're actually listening and you get sucked into the world. You want to listen for an experience of seeing the world in your mind's eye where where all of a sudden you see pictures and images and feelings, right? People who basically are bringing your story to life. Um, people that are creating narrators that are creating a sense of intimacy and immediacy. So you feel like you're right there in the action of the book. That's the experience you want. And if you, um, uh, and, um, I'm sorry, Michelle, you just mentioned, um, Elwell and Andy as well mentioned um, getting books from the library. If, if part of this research, you don't have to pay to get books, you can often uh, rent these books, get them digitally from your local library. And that's why that's why I suggested looking um, and listening to books that are a year or two older because they're normally all, already in your library and you won't have to wait to rent them. Just to get yourself up to speed. Once you're up to speed and once you, you sort of have an idea of what good narration is, then of course you have to select someone, right? So when you have your list of the narrators that you're that you're thinking about, have each of them is going to give you a sample, you know, um, you know, five to 10 minutes of your book is pretty standard. Um, and you're going to listen to that and figure out, okay, who do you want to select? You want, you're looking for someone who has a tone and a musicality that matches your own voice or that of your protagonist. Um, you're going to listen for if your book has characters that have um, a variety of accents um, you're going to listen for, you know, characteristics of your characters and uh, make sure that in your sample that you give um, for people to submit that they have those, uh, that they have those challenges so that you can actually discern who is best at them. Um, you know, you want to avoid when you're listening, anybody that is flat, monotonous, that doesn't have any texture or life, you want to avoid those. Um, and I'm going to advocate because you're going to get, you know, when if you do this, if you do these, um, if you send out things to uh, narrators because of awards they've won, um, lists they come up on, um, you're going to get a, a variety in, in prices, right? People are going to quote different prices. Um, and I'm going to encourage you not to necessarily pick the cheapest, but actually pick the best, right? Um, there's a reason. There's a reason why some people are more expensive. It's because they have. Um, they may have more awards. They may uh, get reviewed more frequently. Um, they may have a larger fan base. In fact, all of those things. And many listeners, um, just like readers who follow particular authors, many listeners follow specific narrators, and they will follow narrators across authors, across genres. Um, so sometimes you're hiring somebody um, who's very skilled uh, and not just because they're skilled, but also because they bring their own fan base. They bring the potential for more exposure with reviews um, and awards. Um, also, I would encourage you to be open to non-traditional casting. Uh, you know, listening, uh, audiobooks is a listening medium and it's not a visual medium. And just because your protagonist may be uh, may look a certain way doesn't mean that your narrator has to, right? Um, 
you want to you want to hire the person that's got the best voice uh, to voice your book. Um, and if you reach out to somebody and they're not available, because many people are very busy, especially in this time when business is booming, the one thing about this industry that I find is narrators are are, are very generous. And if you reach out to somebody and they're not available, ask them for a referral. They will often have two or three people that they're used to working with in their same genre that they know um, who are good and who are reliable and uh, they can give you some referrals. And uh, I think that's it in terms of the short and dirty of it. I like to say that's calling on the narrator mafia. You guys are all interconnected and help each other out in getting jobs, which is- Absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> Um, Andy, I wonder if you can talk to us a little bit about the different options um, of paying for production versus royalty share and royalty share plus that we often see come into play from some of these do-it-yourself platforms. Yeah, absolutely. So um, pay for production is also known as a buyout, which means that you are going to pay for the narration, the post-production, the production coordination, possibly a union contribution all in one project fee that is like a package deal and you are buying out that um, you're, you're paying for those mp3s or wave files or whatever and they are yours to upload to your choice of distributor and you won't owe um, your narrator or production company uh, any cut of the royalties going forward who chooses that generally speaking authors who know that their audiobook is going to do well and they want to pay up front and keep the proceeds um, so the royalty share options, there is now with uh, ACX, there's royalty share or royalty share plus. Plain royalty share means that the narrator doesn't really get anything up front and they also bear the costs of production, the post-production costs themselves, which means that bef yes, it is a royalty share, but they start out in the red until the um, share of the royalties, you know, makes up the cost that they've already uh, had to put forward, then they start to make a profit from that book. So you could probably imagine this is not the most attractive option to a narrator, um, but there might be scenarios where it, it works out okay. Um, because of that, Royalty Share Plus um, means that you are contributing toward the upfront costs of production and it's a royalty share. And as a, as a union actor myself, one of the most encouraging things to happen recently is that if that royalty share plus is at least $100 per finished hour, could be more, but if it's at least that, then um, I, as a union narrator, would actually get pension and health contributions made based on the royalties. And wow, that is a game changer um, because we're all... Uh, <laughs> wanting to be eligible for health coverage, obviously, in this situation. So that is Royalty Share, Royalty Share Plus, and Pay for Production. Um, the service Audiobooks Unleashed also has some more creative things where you can agree that royalties go to the narrator until their production costs are recouped, and then the royalties are shared. Um, so there's some creativity in the marketplace for sure. That's great to know. Thank you. And since we're talking about royalties, we did have a question that came in asking if there are services that offer background music for audiobooks that already have paid for the music and performance rights. Um, does anyone here in what they do add music to their audiobooks? Paul would probably know the most about music with audiobooks, being a musician himself. Um, thanks. Uh, I, th there are some audiobooks, some publishers do like to have like like bumpers at the, at the beginning of a book and at the end of a book. Um, I have never worked that way when I produce an audiobook. Um, and the licensing services that I've gone through, um, I'm I'm paying for the the mechanical uh, the mechanical rights to the music, and that can that can get into the thousands of dollars. So I I have never um, I've never looked for a a free or prepaid licensing solution for music. So, I mean, that's, that's as much as I can really comment on knowledgeably when it comes to music and audiobooks. Sure, I will say I certainly see a lot of publishers actually having original music produced just for this reason, so that um, they can have the, the rights. And Paul, do you produce some of that music? <laughs> I, I can, 
I certainly can. I've never done it for an audio book, but yeah, I've, I've, I'm, I'm a musician and a composer. So yes. Excellent. I want to offer though, that it's not an expectation that yeah. listeners have. Most audiobook listeners, they just want the voice. Right. Um, I think it's not something that you would necessarily want to put the money toward. And there are a number of services that are more that lean more towards the podcast realm, which I think that you could look up and you can get royalty for your free music there as well. Mm -hmm. So if it is something that you're interested in, there are some ways to go look for royalty free services for music or think about if you know a musician who's willing to help you out. Uh, and Paul is stepping up to, uh, to do that, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to turn things over to Paul Heisch, who is also, um, as well as being a musician, is also uh, a narrator. And he is going to talk to us about what it means to collaborate with your narrator, because this is a hugely important piece of the process, whether you're going through a do-it-yourself platform, working directly, or even working through a publisher or a producer, uh, you know, a professional studio, there is oftentimes some interaction that is not necessarily required, but certainly helpful in making sure that the process goes smoothly and that the finished product is as good as it can be. So take it away, Paul. Hi, thanks, Michelle. Um, the, the key word is collaborating. Um, when you work with a narrator on your book, you become partners in the creation of this new version of your book. And um, the, the other thing to keep in mind is, is you know your book better than anybody, but your narrator's job is to sound like they know your book the way you know your book. So communication is really crucial. Anything you can give your narrator that will help them understand your book uh, in, a, in a way that, that lets them connect to the story and connect the listener to the story is going to be extraordinarily helpful. So um, keep us in the loop about, um, you know, any any uh any information you can you you can provide about the the story arc the um the characters in the story particularly aspects of those characters that would impact how they speak if they if there's something physical about them if they're from a certain geographical region um that that stuff is is hugely helpful for the narrator to know when they're when they're preparing to record your book. We we read the book before we record, but there could be nuances that we either miss or that um that aren't aren't necessarily there, but it's how you've conceived your story and your characters. So if you have something like a story bible and a cast list for your characters, all of those things are like I said they're extraordinarily helpful to helping your, your narrator connect to your version of the story. Um, and, and give us, give us all of that before we, we start recording. Um, the, the, we, we don't want to be surprised. Um, if you have a roadmap for the, for, for a series, if, if you're, if you're going to be working with your narrator on a series of books, uh, knowing where that series is going is also hugely helpful for, for from the first book on. Um, if there's a if there's a secondary or a tertiary character in book one who gets their own story in book three, let us know that too because then we can make uh, a, a sensible choice on how to voice that character in book one. You know, if there's if there's an innkeeper that that's described as being very gruff and rah, 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 you you don't want to give him a voice that's going to be hard to sustain for an entire book. So um, those those kinds of things are, as I said, they're they're very very helpful. Um, the the manuscript that you give us when we start to record should be the absolute etched in stone final version of the manuscript. If we are in the process of recording the book, and you decide, oh gee, the, the what's going on in chapter three doesn't really work. I need to I need to change that. Um, that's a change of scope. And if we're going to have to re go back and re-record chapter three and maybe subsequent chapters because the the, the tone of, of the action has changed because of what you changed in chapter three, that's extra work for us. And we charge extra for that because, again, it's it's a change of scope. It's not it's not uh, covered in the initial contract that the, the contract should specify that 
the, the script we get when we start recording is the final version. Um, although, if you can give us a version that we can edit in terms of changing the fonts, changing the margins, um, that's also very helpful. Like, I don't think a .mobi uh, version allows you to make those kinds of changes, but a PDF or a Word doc will will allow us to reformat the book so that it's easier for us to 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 read from visually while we're recording. The less the less visual noise that I have when I'm when I'm reading from the script, uh, the easier it is for me to stay focused on the performance. Um, and that's that's pretty much all I I have for collaborating. If anybody else wants to chime in with their ideas, please feel free. Um, I'd like to just say that uh, some authors want to be very involved in the production of their audiobook. They enjoy it. Um, they go in and annotate their script. They want to be involved in selecting voices. And then I have had other authors say, here's my book. I'm really busy. I'm working on the next book right now. I don't, I just want there to be an audiobook. Just, I trust you. Um, both approaches are valid and everything in between happens but you should talk up front with your producer or narrator about expectations to make sure that you're absolutely clear on um, when and how you would like to be involved and also be open to that person um, setting boundaries, especially if you're completely new to the process um, and they gently tell you that maybe you're overstepping into um, backseat directing the narrator or giving line readings or something that is not really part of the process, if that makes sense. One point I'd like to make related to that is that whether you are doing a royalty share or it's a buyout, narrators are paid for how long the book is once it's done, not for how many hours we spend in our booths, which Paul and I are in ours <laughs> right now, um, actually recording the book. So. If we get direction after we've already completed the work, that adds a lot more time to, um, to the project for us. And so we're actually making less money per hour. Um, also, as, as Andy said, if, if you've never done this before, I think what you wanna do is hire a producer or narrator that you trust to get you the final project um, because, many of us have done many hundreds of books. Um, and so we, we know what, what works. Um, uh, so just want to make that point. Thank you, Karen. All right, we had some questions come into the chat box. Um, so, or into the Q&A box, and we welcome more to come in. So please put them in the Q&A box. The first one is from an author who's saying that they had a, a middle grade novel come out a couple years ago from a, a top 20 publisher, but the audiobook was never produced. And they're obviously interested in this. Do they still have options to create one? And absolutely the answer is yes. If you're working with an agent, in which case this time they are, go to your agent and ask your agent to go back and see if you can actually take the audiobook rights back if they do not intend to produce it. I see this happen a lot where it's just never been made in audio. You know, you do have the option and the right to ask that publisher if they're never going to make it in audio to allow you to do just that. All right, and let's talk a little bit about nonfiction. This can be challenging. It's a little bit different. What do you do uh, if you have something like charts and graphs? You know, what kind of workarounds do we have in there? Andy, can you talk to that at all? Uh, I've done a couple of books that have charts and graphs. And um, what you can do is have a PDF supplement to the audiobook. And so then on the product page on whatever platform the listener is, is buying your audiobook from, it'll say, oh, you've bought this audiobook, download the PDF supplement here. And then usually there's some verbiage, um, you know, either at the beginning or at the end, or possibly, you know, if there's a section of charts and graphs, um, it might prompt the listener again to remember that those are all available, just not in audio. Um, and so that's usually how that's handled. Um, 
if there are footnotes or those kinds of things, um, I've seen sometimes when a footnote can be brought up in line with text as sort of an aside. Um, and then sometimes the footnotes are, are really not um, something that the listener is going to need in order to get the most out of the book. And so those are not read. Um, and other things while we're on what are not read. Um, acknowledgements are usually not read. Um, tables of contents, those kinds of things. You can imagine how, <laughs> how fascinating a table of contents would be in audio. Yes, we definitely want to make the listening experience strong. So that does mean occasionally changing something or cutting things out. But nonfiction is being done more and more in audio. It's a growing piece of the market. So, you know, for years and years, it was hovering around 20 to 25% of the market. And in 2019, it actually got over 30%. And I expect that with the big 2020 political year, when we do the Audio Publishers Association sales survey, we'll find that nonfiction buying was quite strong. <laughs> All right, there was one more question that came in. What advice can you offer for authors that want to narrate their own audiobooks? This is a tough one. Paul, thoughts on that? Well, um, first of all, are, are you a good enough voice actor to do justice to your story? Are, are you gonna be able to connect listeners to your story with your voice? Um, and you need that's something you need to be uh, brutally honest with yourself about. Um, the other the other aspect is the technical side. Uh, you can if you're going to record it yourself, you need to have an appropriate space to record in. You need to have uh, good enough equipment to record with. You also have to be ready to run the marathon that is narrating an audiobook. I mean, it's it's. Uh, it's a lot more work than just speaking words into a microphone. And um, you, there are a lot of, of de un unexpected details and obstacles that, that you, you may not realize you're going to run into until you run into them. Um, if, if you're not going to record it yourself, then you need to find a studio that has an appropriate space and um, an engineer who knows audiobooks, who has worked on audiobooks before, because it's a very different style of production than uh, a, a, a musical recording. Um, so there's, um, there, there are some resources online that you can, you can tap into to help you decide if, if narrating your own book is for you. Uh, Karen Cummins has the um, Narrator's Roadmap website, which has a lot of information about people who are considering getting into audiobooks. And Sean Allen Pratt has a video that where uh, he uh, basically gives you an exercise to try to, th that will give you a feel for what narrating a book looks and feels like. Um, so I, I would encourage any, uh, anyone thinking about this to check both of those things out and decide for yourself if this is really what what you want to do with your book. Can I chime in here too, Michelle? Absolutely. Uh, and just I, I, I put Derrida's roadmap uh, link in the chat for everyone. Um, I, I would also say that if you decide to go this route, that um, you should seriously consider hiring a director um, if you do not have uh, any performance experience, um, but but really feel that that you must narrate your own book. Um, uh, I think you're, you would be doing yourself a huge favor and service by hiring a director if this is the route you go. Um, I've directed um, several uh, authors who've narrated their own books and um, it, it, uh, it's challenging. As, as everything Paul said, it's really challenging for someone who's a novice, even though you know your material and you're passionate about your material, there are just certain skills and techniques and um, you know, training that you just don't have. And it's, it's a physical task as well as a performance task. And um, so any help that you can get to assist yourself, you should avail yourself to. And in fact, the Audio Publishers Association Consumer Survey, which is done every year, and the next version will be coming out in April, it does say that consumers actually prefer a professional narrator. Although many authors um, can do a fine job, it's that subtlety of performance that we find from performers and narrators who do this all the time. We cannot overemphasize how difficult it is. I could never do it. <laughs> 
All right, so uh, again, if you have any questions, put those in the um, Q&A box. Uh, we do have one more. Uh, and we're going to talk about marketing next. So let's kick off with this question. How do you get your new audiobook reviewed? Um, this author is thrilled with the performance and would love to see it nominated for awards. So how do you get it reviewed and where do you submit for awards? Anyone want to field that? Well, I'll, I'll field the easy part of the review. Uh, if you would like it to be reviewed by um, Audiophile Magazine, I'm going to put an email in the chat box for you. That's Audiophile Magazine. Uh, you send it to editor at audiophilemagazine.com just with a link to the title on Audible. You don't need to give us a credit or anything like that. Or if it's pre-publication, send it via a file service like Hightail or Dropbox so that um, we can potentially put it out for review. And always tell the editor why this title, what makes you think that it should be reviewed. There's lots of other review sources. Um, anyone want to jump in here? All right, I'll just keep talking. Um, can, book, Karen, can, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ron mentioned this, that oftentimes um, narrators will have their own followings and, and be up on social media. So many of us have uh, relationships with bloggers or Instagrammers who um, review specifically audiobooks and can help direct you that way. But um, Google is your friend here to find um, audiobook review sites. Um, just like you would uh, hire a promotional company to do a tour for um, an independently released print and ebook, you can do the same for audiobooks. Um, and there are many, um, depending on your genre, but there are Facebook groups that uh, focus on and are fan groups that talk about audiobooks. Um, many who will have events where you can go live, maybe with your narrator to talk about the book, to have the narrator read the book um, live. And um, there are also, depending on um, how you distribute, if you're, you can get review codes um, from Audible or Find Away or wherever you're distributing through that you can give away online um, in return for a review um, on Audible or on other sites, on Goodreads, on BookBub. Um, that's a good way to get listener reviews out there, um, which are important um, in, in order to sell books. Great. And we had one more production question um, come in that we'll deal with in, in a second. But I also wanted to say in terms of awards, uh, the Audi Awards, there's the Sovas, there's the Independent um, uh, audio, Audiobook Awards, there is the ALA Audiobook Awards, the Odyssey. So there's a, a wide range. And again, Google is your friend to um, search for who does audiobooks. In fact, I just recently noticed that the New York Radio Festival has an audiobook cat category as well. So lots of opportunities um, to submit your title to be potentially an award winner. Uh, coming up on March 22nd is the virtual Audis. That's kind of the Oscars of the audio publishing world. I invite you to go to the audis.com to see who is nominated and to find out how to watch us um, give away those awards live virtually on the 22nd of March. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, more about marketing. Ron, any thoughts that you have um, that you can share with authors in how their narrators might help them market or how they should be marketing their audiobooks? Um, as far as as far as narrators, as far as narrators go, um, they're, I find that in general, the narrators are very much on board with um, using every bit of social media they can. To um, help promote, uh, to help promote their books. Um, I mean, that's it's really uh, that's really the way of the world these days is social media, and with all the increasing platforms. Um, I mean, between uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. I, I'll speak for myself on all these platforms. Whenever I have releases, um, I am I am um, doing my best to push information out about these books that I'm narrating on all the social media platforms. There's also new developments in, in, in audio. Um, Clubhouse 
Um, Twitter has started something, Discord, um, and uh, even Instagram is also starting an, an audio portion where um, uh, producers, publishers, and narrators, if it's if it's if if they think it's um, helpful, um, will let narrators read portions or you know half an hour or an hour um, that they can advertise as a teaser for your book, right? So there's all these ways that, on, at least from the narration side, that um, narrators are helping market and push the books that they're narrating. Um, can someone else speak to um, the uh, producer side of it? Um, I can. I think um, I'm seeing a lot of authors treat the casting reveal in the same way that they treat their cover reveal. So, mm -hmm. you know, for a while there's a placeholder cover and then one day, the author posts everywhere, look at this gorgeous cover, I'm so excited. And it's just yet another signal that, hey, this book is coming out um, and starting to build that anticipation. And so by the same token, when you reveal your casting, that's something that the uh, narrators and the producer can certainly boost your signal or help you with that. And um, if you're planning on using that as part of your marketing cycle, be really clear with the, um, narrators and producer, that that's going to be information that's embargoed until a particular date so that they don't scoop you on your own marketing plan. Um, that's really, really important to be on the same page when it comes to marketing. Ask your narrator and your producer about some creative things that they have um, participated in because nobody knows everything, but everybody knows something. And maybe they'll have an idea that strikes you as being fun, creative, and in keeping with the tone of your book. And Andy, I'm going to give this follow-up question to you, Karen. I'll come back to you in a second. Um, someone was asking about the price of the book, and since you've talked about the uh, royalty share, so I'm putting into the chat um, how to calculate your hours of audiobooks. It's about 9,200 words per hour. And then, what can someone expect to pay, Andy? Um, obviously, you've talked about nothing, but how how high does it go? Well, if you're going to look at the tiers that producers can choose in ACX, um, I would say that if you want to price your offer in a way that's going to attract a certain caliber of narrator who's working at a certain level, commanding a certain price point, um, the two upper tiers on ACX are, uh, last time I checked anyway, there's a, a $200 to $400 per finished hour tier and then $400 on up. Um, and I do mean on up. <laughs> so, um, so those two tiers would allow a union narrator, for example, to, um, to have a project qualify for their union benefits and cover their production costs. If you go below $200 per finished hour as a project fee, um, then that's not going to be something that um, professional union narrators are going to really be interested in, in doing. Um, frankly, because we have enough uh, union qualifying work that we don't need to dip into non-union work most of the time, so. So it really truly is a range and both ACX and Find Away Voices can give you some bands of costs. Obviously, if you are going to get a celebrity, it's much, much higher. <laughs> Karen, let's go back to you to talk a little bit more about marketing. Well, one thing I wanted to suggest is that while bigger books, um, books that have a lot of marketing budget behind them may, um, from major publishers, may release the audio and the print at the same time. As an independent publisher um, and author publishing my own work, I have discovered that that's not necessarily the best way to go. Um, if I am publishing my audiobook three months, say, after I release the print and ebook version, then I get a whole new um, set of opportunities to talk about my book. Oftentimes, um, readers, as Michelle said, uh, will buy both, oh, or um, they'll they'll read with their ears on KU and then listen with their, uh, read with their ear, uh, I can't even speak, read with their <laughs> eyes on KU perhaps, and then read with their ears on Audible or whatever other platforms you're on. Um, and again, it's another way, just like the cover reveal or and your narrator reveal to get Instagrammers and, um, and bloggers to talk about your book 
maybe I've had even had bloggers re-review the book once it comes out in, in audio or add a, a new section to their review and repost it um, regarding the narration. So that's something to think about to let go of that pressure. You could even release it a year later. Maybe you wanna see how the series is selling. And once you know that series is doing well, then you go back and you could do a rapid release so that you get them coming out you know, once every couple of months. So don't take that pressure off yourself because I think it's actually more useful to go to, to not simultaneous release. If I can add a footnote to that um, sure. regarding the stress. So the, the strange thing about as a producer, once we upload and, every, and everybody's approved everything, it kind of goes around the dark side of the moon. Um, I don't have a secret phone number to find out exactly when something is going to go live if no pre-order has been set up. And we have had situations where a pre-order was supposed to happen and the title went live, the, the audio went live before the print and there was a bit of a scramble. So um, remember that your audiobook producer is your partner and try to solve problems together because there is a certain out of control aspect to that pre-release period and things, things happen. Uh, I think 2019, 60,303 audiobooks were produced by the industry as a whole. Um, so even if 1% of those don't go exactly the way they were planned, that's a lot. I think that's a great way to end. As with anything, communication is key to success. Uh, I hope you've had an opportunity to learn a lot of great things here. We have some great people in the audience who are helping us out. One thing I will let you know is we did put a lot of stuff in the chat. So if you don't know how, don't know how to save chat, I'm gonna teach you. If you click on the chat box and then look in the bottom right-hand corner, there are three little dots that say more. If you click on those dots, you have the opportunity to save chat to your local computer and to keep all of those resources. Thanks for coming today. And I'm going to hand things back over to Chris. I'm Michelle Cobb from Audiophile Magazine. Thank you to Ron and Karen and Andy and Paul for all of this great information. Thank you for coming, everybody. My pleasure. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Love this festival, been involved since the first year, and it's so great to see it flourish even in this crazy year. <laughs> so you all are veterans, that's awesome. Oh, somebody said this was the best panel of the festival so far. Yeah, good job. <laughs> are, are we the first panel of the festival? It's been going on all weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and I can I just say I'll be back in about 10 days, I think, um, as Karen Gray on a contemporary romance panel. So I oh, hope that's you guys awesome. will come back for that. I think it's noon on Thursday the 25th or something like that. Yeah. Fantastic. So, well put put a link to that in the chat so we uh, you, know where to find you. Yeah. Well, and we do hope to see lots of people attending the Audis next Monday. It's going to be very exciting. We had to learn a whole new thing, but um, I think people will have a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone. The, uh, the video will be posted on the Virginia Festival of the Books uh, website. Uh, so if you want to revisit any resources or anything like that, you can grab them then. Oh, there Otherwise, you are, Karen. It. Thanks for posting that, Karen. It's found it now. Oh, Actually, okay. this is the better. Yeah, mm -hmm. There we go. Time for that. There you are. That's fun. And now I know how to save it. That's very exciting. Thanks, Michelle. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, I never <laughs> You're knew welcome. that. See, I spend all day, every day on Zoom, and this is what I know now. <laughs> okay. There we go. There's a new link. Karen Gray. Give today. Okay, we can shut down the panel now, I guess, huh? Take care. Right. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye. Have a good day. Everybody.